Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Glendale Commission on the Status of Women, May 9th, 2011. Ms. Baboumian, may we have a roll call, please? Or Ms. Cordova, I'm sorry, I will get that right sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Danielian. Present. Chair Devine. Here. Commissioner Garcevanian. Commissioner Hunt. Here. Vice Chair Chastian. Present. Commissioner Walker. Next item. The agenda for May 9th, 2011 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside of City Hall on or before May 6, 2011. Two is introductions and presentations. Two A is Dr. John Kirk, Glendale Adventist Medical Center, osteoporosis. Doctor? Um, Chair Ms. Devine, Baboumian. I'd like to introduce um, Dr. John Kirk from Glendale Adventist Medical Center. He's a practicing gynecologist here in Glendale. He will be giving our presentation on osteoporosis. Uh, Dr. Kirk attended Yale Medical School and he served his residency at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. And he has over seven years experience and a wealth of knowledge about many, many topics. He's actually going to come back to the city of Glendale and give a presentation on the aging process as well. So welcome, Dr. Kirk. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Devine. Commissioners, appreciate you inviting me uh, on this important topic for women, for men as well. Um, we're going to be talking about osteoporosis. We're going to try to understand a little bit about what it is and how it affects us. I am the medical director of Glendale Gynecology Group. I've been here for about 10 months, came down from Napa Valley. I don't know what exactly made me come down here, except I love this city. I really enjoy the diversity here. I'm also the director of robotic surgery at Glendale Adventist Medical Center, sort of a, a subspecialty. I've been doing that for about seven and a half years and practicing for about 15. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis means porous bone or openings in the bone. It's something that steals away from its victim's bone mass without them really knowing it at all. This is what it looks like. The picture on the left is normal bone. You see a kind of an architecture, it looks sort of strong. On the right, same process, that's bone, but that's osteoporotic bone. You can imagine how easy that might be to shatter or break, given the wrong situation. It doesn't take a lot, as we'll find out. Well, there's a lot of myths about osteoporosis. Most people think it's not that big of a deal. Why do I need to worry about it? Well, it's a progressive disease. It's not reversible. It weakens your bones. Um, even a small turn or a bump into something can actually shatter a bone when you have severe osteoporosis. And obviously, if you have these broken bones, chronic pain, disability, or significantly potential negative outcomes. But even worse, obviously, is death. Uh, with hip fractures, it's a very common finding. In fact, 24% of people who have, excuse me, uh, women who have fractures of the hip have a 24% increased risk of dying in the next year after that fracture. Some more myths. I'm a healthy person. I do the right things, so I'm not at risk. Actually, almost everyone's at risk at some level. Being a woman puts you at more risk. About one in two women will experience osteoporotic or osteopenic problems through their, the course of their life. And about one in five to one in six men after the age of 50 will experience the same thing. Another myth. I'm too young to worry about osteoporosis. Actually, that's probably not true either. It's never too young. Um, bone mass peaks at the age of 20 to 25. And it's all downhill from there. We hate to hear that, I'm sure. But at the, at the end of the day, even at 10 years old, following a reasonable diet and good exercise, weight-bearing exercise will help you. And we'll talk about that shortly. It's a living, growing tissue bone. It's something that you want to take serious, just like all the rest of your body, even more so than your teeth, which aren't really living, although in the uh, lower part of it they are. Last myth here, it's too late for me to do anything. I'm, I'm over the hill. Well. You know, that's not true either. Even though you can't reverse the problems of osteoporosis, you actually can stem it, treat it, and move forward to build the strongest bone that you can build. And we'll talk about how to do that. How prevalent is this? 28 million people, mostly women, about 80%, suffer from osteoporosis. About one in two are women. As I said, one in five to six are men. What are the problems? Well, the most uh, uh, severe issues are fractures. Clearly hip fractures, 300,000 of those per year are the most grave. Uh, vertebral fractures are the most common at 700,000 and many people never realize that they've actually experienced this and in many cases experience multiple fractures. It shortens them. They start to curve over a little bit, hunching. You don't think about it because it happens, it sneaks up on you. 
even wrist fractures, falling and catching yourself. You know, most of us, that won't break our wrist, but with osteoporosis, very commonly it does. And additional fractures, another 300,000. This is a huge problem, medically speaking, and a huge problem economically. $14 billion is spent annually on this. That's more than congestive heart failure and asthma, which you think of as very common problems, but in fact, it's, it's significantly greater. $38 million a day is spent on this disease. What's the burden? Well, the burden is that you can be bedridden, disabled. Uh, I don't know that I would look as happy as the lady in the middle, but she's a very lovely lady. Um, you can actually, one in two women who experience a, a, a fracture of the hip end up never being able to walk again. Not by themselves, not without assistance. So one in four osteoporotic hip fractures uh, result in long-term nursing care. Uh, as I just said, one half of them are unable to walk and a 24% increased risk of dying that I mentioned. So there's that picture I talked about, is that you get those fractures in the spine, they start to collapse on themselves, and they, don't grow, they do heal, but they don't heal normally. They heal in a position where you start to cave over, um, sort of gravity taking its effect. So what are the symptoms, what are the warning signs that we look for here? Well, there's persistent unexplained back pain. A case in point, I had a patient who was a young woman uh, in her mid-30s. She had had her second child and uh, started to experience a great deal of pain afterwards in the lower back. That's a very common problem. Back pain affects probably 40% of us. At the end of the day, she had multiple fractures in her spine and was found to have osteoporosis. Very atypical. But there are risk factors that might have set her up for that. Um, you end up being shorter than you used to be. There's spinal deformities, of course. Um, recurrent fractures, fractures from just bumping into something, as we talked about. And then other chronic medical problems will start to seep in. What are the risk factors here? Well, being female clearly is one of the major risk factors. Can't change that. Having a thin or small frame, one of the few things that being thin isn't good for. Uh, low body weight, again, challenging. Particularly extra low body weight or under the, the normal weight is a, a risk factor. Smoking. And then excessive alcohol. And I say excessive because moderate amounts of alcohol actually seem to build bone. So there is a fine line there, as there is with... Uh, with a heart attack uh, prevention, as there is with breast cancer. Additional risk factors, the older we get, the more risk we have. Um, any fragility fractures, you know, particularly fractures of bones after the age of 30. History of primary relatives with osteoporosis and fr fragility fractors. Being blonde, from naturally blonde, um, tends to increase your risk as well, based on genetics. Postmenopausally is where this risk really starts to increase the most. Hormonal balances lead to rapid bone loss, and believe it or not, 20% of the bone mass can be lost within about five to six, seven years. Amenorrhea, meaning having no periods, um, not eating well, anorexia and bulimia, common problem amongst young women. Low calcium diets, again, a common problem amongst young women and young people in general. Some medications like steroids can be disastrous for bone growth. And then low testosterone in men, which is a more common problem than we probably realize. Who are the highest at risk? Hispanic women um, are ultimately the highest at risk. And that's actually changed over the years. About 13 to 16 percent of Hispanic women actually have osteoporosis right now. Many of them don't know it. 36 to 49 percent, almost half of Hispanic women or Mexican women um, have, uh, that are over 50 have significant bone loss, meaning either osteoporosis or osteopenia. And we'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Caucasian and Asian American women are also at high risk, the next highest risks, if you will. Um, Caucasian uh, uh, people are heavier in general in terms of body mass index, but at the end of the day they have more fractures, and heavy is actually protective of the bone, but they have more fractures of the hips than Asians, but both have more fractures than African Americans. Nonetheless, African Americans are also at risk. 10% have osteoporosis over the age of 50, and 30% more have low, low bone mineral density. How do we diagnose this? Well, obviously you want to see your physician or your provider. You're going to expect to have a full history, as you should any time you see your, your, your physician or provider. You should have an examination. And depending on the situation, depending on your risk factors, you may have other studies like an x-ray or a bone density or dexatometry. We'll talk about that. What do you do when you go in to be diagnosed or you're having a pain or you're just going in for your annual exam, your pap smear, your breast exam, your mammogram request, et cetera? 
Well, be prepared to describe what symptoms you're having. Um, certainly we should be asking you those questions as well. Gather a medical history for yourself. Make a list of the medications, because as we said, certain medications will affect your bone strength. Write down the concerns and the questions. This is something we often fail to do as patients. It's, it's like you go in and you just forget what it was you really wanted to complain about. Where all that list of things that are wrong with the car, you only remember a few of them. Write them down. Bring them in. Bring in a friend as well. This is something I didn't write up. But sometimes bringing in a friend or a relative when you're nervous and you're talking to docs, because sometimes we make you nervous and that's not our, our goal. We really want you to be you know, as, as open with us as possible. But bring, bring a friend to take notes even. Um, that sometimes can help you kind of focus. Being in the appointment, what should you expect from the treatment? These are the types of things. You're going to expect us to hear you, listen to your, your needs and listen to your symptoms. What kind of treatments are effective for uh, daily activities? Or, or excuse me, what kind of treatment, what kind of effects do the treatments have on daily activities? Am I going to be limited if I start taking these medications? What are going to be my symptoms or my, my side effects, if you will? And then how do I prevent further disability? What do I do to actually stop the process of bone loss? Well, here's the study of a bone densitometry. There are many different ways to do this. This is one of the classic ways. This is uh, probably the most advanced types of systems that are out now. There are also systems that will check your heel, check your wrist. There are even ultrasound systems that have no radi radiation exposure whatsoever. Um, they're suboptimal. This is the gold standard of care. This is a dual emission um, uh, x-ray uh, uh, system. And uh, it is what we like to use to be able to diagnose women um, and men with osteoporosis or osteopenia. Um, so who should have the bone nets and optometry? A lot of people think that as soon as you hit menopause, you should have it. That's not necessarily true, menopause being an average age of about 51. Um, really, if you are a very healthy person, you're exercising, you're taking your calcium, you don't have a number of risk factors, there's no real strong reason that you need to get a bone density until you hit the age of 65. That seems to be consistent with the data that we have on fracture risks. But if you have risk factors, particularly two risk factors, there's certainly a, a reason to get that when you hit menopause. It gives you a baseline. At that time, you may end up needing to be treated. Um, and then men over 50 with risk factors also. How do we treat it? Well, there are medications, and they're the primary um, stays of actual treatment, but clearly prevention is always the best medicine, as they say. Prevention is exercise, weight-bearing exercise, um, jogging, uh, jumping, jumping rope, lifting even mild amounts of weight more than your body weight, doing squats, for example. Just your body weight is helpful, but not nearly as helpful as even five pounds in each hand if you do walking or if you do squats, for example. What are the medications? Oh, let me go back to the prevention. Calcium, actually I'll get to this shortly, but calcium and vitamin D are imperative throughout your whole life, and we'll talk about this shortly. But if you really have this problem, what do we do with it? The most common treatment are bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are name brands like Alendronate or Fosamax. Um, these are medicines that are um, widely used over the last 10 to 15 years. Recently, you may have heard of femur fractures. There's some data in the, uh, the country of Sweden that shows an increased risk of femur fractures with people who use bisphosphonates. So it's, it's, it's not a reason to stop bisphosphonates because they work far better than many of the other medications. And the risk is very small. Five additional femur fractures and their hairline fractures out of 10,000 women. But it is an increased risk. The risk goes away quickly if you stop using the bisphosphonates. So taking a what they call drug holiday, stopping that medication for those people in the audience who have actually uh, who are actually on bisphosphonates, Fosamax being the largest of the, the group, uh, Boniva, you, you, hear, you see Sally Field uh, advertising that. Those are the medications that are bisphosphonates. Um, even taking a year off will lower the risk of those fractures by 70%. Now, of course, this is a Swedish study. They're a higher risk. They're the blondes, remember? They're at higher risk for fractures. So it may or may not actually pertain to our, our um, ethnicity and, and mixed ethnicity here in America. Estrogen replacement therapy is both a treatment and a maintenance uh, therapy. Um, clearly, women under the age of 50, before menopause, tend to experience a lot less osteoporotic problems, notwithstanding the case that I told you about. Uh, and that's largely because of estrogen's ability to help maintain and grow bone. Um, bone, remember, is constantly turning over. It's, it's um, remodeling itself. And you obviously want to build more than you're getting rid of. That's what estrogen does for you. 
There are medications from natural hormones. We could hear of bioidentical hormones. Those are the same as estrogen replacement therapy in as much as they are estrogen. They're the estrogens that the body makes naturally. And there's no reason not to think of those as treatments as well. Calcitonin made from salmon, believe it or not, is also a treatment. And CIRMs, what is a CIRM? It's a serotonin, uh, excuse me, it's a selective estrogen receptor modifier much easier to say CIRM. Uh, basically it's an artificial estrogen that has unique properties, some of which are like estrogen and some of which are not like estrogen. We use that with prevention of breast cancer. For example, there's a medicine called raloxifene. You'll see a little slide here coming up shortly about how we use raloxifene in the picture of uh, treatment during the course of life. Um, some, of the, some of the new products that are coming out also will, will uh, be used to treat both breast cancer and osteoporosis. What are under investigation? Vitamin D metabolites, things that build vitamin D or, or the precursors of vitamin D. Parathyroid hormone, the, the parathyroid is right next to the thyroid in the neck. New bisphosphonates, as I just mentioned, um, and new CIRMs, as I just mentioned. Here's one of those two, two uh, upcoming uh, slides you're going to see that are a little bit more complicated. But the goal here is on the left, you see short-term vasomotor symptom management. What are we trying to do here? We're treating menopausal, postmenopausal osteoporosis based on the time of life. Certainly, if you're having symptoms of hot flashes, continuing estrogen replacement therapy or hormone replacement therapy is a very reasonable thing. Not to be taken lightly because there are clearly side effects as many of us have ha heard and I'd love to come back and talk to you about uh, the whole issue of hormone replacement because it's a very important topic for women. Um, but that's really the most logical and sensible approach for continuing treatment. Then we go into osteoporosis prevention in the 55s and 70 a year period, we're looking at raloxifene. This is one of those CIRMs, also recently shown to decrease breast cancer by close to 50 to 60 percent. Uh, in women who have had breast cancer, it's often used to prevent a recurrence of breast cancer. It has that nice added benefit of also building bone. And then finally, bisphosphonates, and one called parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is extremely expensive. It's certainly not the, per, the first choice if you can avoid it. But some women will not tolerate estrogen for, for history and risk factors. They will not tolerate raloxifene for the same reasons. And they will not tolerate bisphosphonates because of problems related to the esophagus and other concerns and issues that may, may come up. So parathyroid hormone is a very strong builder of bone and something that uh, is used in the later years. Then the uh, final picture here is osteoporosis therapy algorithm, if you will, again, postmenopausal women. So the risk of fracture by itself just goes up with age. Down on the bottom, we see the T-score. This is what we get when we do a bone density on women. And anything more than 2.5 or negative 2.5, we should say less than negative 2.5, means that you have a higher risk and you have osteoporosis. Um, below that, osteopenia, and then be below 1.5 you have normal rates uh, of bone. Um, and what this is related to, no matter what your age, it's comparing you to a 20 to 25 year old woman of the same ethnicity. So it's where the peak bone mass is and you're comparing it to that particular uh, individual as to how many standard deviations this T-score is, you're away. Not to get too complicated, the key number is 2.5 is osteoporosis and the higher it is, the worse your problem is. So you're at risk of osteopenia on the left, you have osteoporosis right at 2.5 and severe osteoporosis on the right. You start that hormone therapy there in the early ages, in that early risk of osteopenia and just into the osteoporosis. Kind of graduate to raloxifene, seems to work a little bit better still. You may add those bisphosphonates later on. If you need more help, you're not getting that same benefit as you follow the DEXA score. Calcitonin, again, from salmon. Sometimes it's a good choice for women when they can't tolerate any of the other options. And then parathyroid hormone, as we talked about. Calcium prevention. Um, calcium and vitamin D, 600 to 800 units per day and 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium. Um, this is from the National Academy of Science. But you can consult your doctor because there are things related to, to your kidneys and other issues that may cause you to change these doses. Here's sort of the calcium requirements written in a different way, ages 9 to 18, 1,300 milligrams a day, etc. You see it right there. Prevention, again, in, involves, if you can, eat healthy. I mean, that's th always the best way to go. Um, you see uh, broccoli here. Kale is, is probably the perfect food, K-A-L-E. It's, it's, there is probably no better food in the, in the universe in terms of value for the calories that you're taking in. Um, sardines, believe it or not, because they have the bones in it, have tons of calcium. Uh, beans, etc. you'll see there. 
Milk, of course. Yogurt is a high uh, um, uh, quantity of calcium in it as well. Weight-bearing exercise we talked about. Tai Chi, something that a lot of people are starting to get into. Uh, the Chinese have known for thousands of years is a great uh, thing. Uh, my son started practicing Kung Fu, and his teacher started teaching him Tai Chi. And I was able to actually relax, which doesn't happen very much with us gynecologists, <laughs> obstetricians. But I was able to relax and really, really feel better doing this. It's a wonderful thing, and it actually strengthens the bones. It, it is weight-bearing exercise. Let's go briefly and to finish by prevention by uh, age. So from 10 to 20, you know, you don't think about this. The kids certainly aren't thinking about it, but as parents, we need to think about this. And that really is in the diet that we give our kids. Make sure they get enough calcium. Make sure they're trying to eat well. Avoid the sweets. I mean, it's common sense. We hear it all the time. Unfortunately, we don't do it enough. But uh, that's so important to get them in the phase of taking in a good diet, and particularly taking in calcium and vitamin D. Um, in addition, exercise. And these kids are running around. Unfortunately, a lot of us, are, uh, when we're 10 and 20 nowadays, are staying in front of the TV more often. So keep in mind, exercise is important here, too. Similarly, at 20 to 35, where your peak bone growth is, you really want to maximize that, that bone growth. Because, as I said, it's all downhill from there. So the more that your diet is appropriate and the more weight-bearing exercise that you've got in this age group, the better, are you are, better off you are as you age. And 35 to 50, just as we approach menopause or menopause, they call it andropause for men, uh, is uh, really a time where the bone growth and the bone loss is, is essentially, or the bone growth is decelerating, the bone loss is accelerating. Uh, so even more important than ever to get that weight-bearing exercise. And again, diet. Same theme here, weight-bearing exercise and diet. And um, this is really where you need to think about that bone density. You need to communicate with your physician. Those risk factors are going to put you over the top to get that bone densitometry. In this age of overpriced medicine and overused medicine, it is important not to just randomly do it and not to demand it. I have patients who come in and they want a bone density every year. Many of them don't need it at all until another 20 years passes, but they want it. The downside is not small. You're getting radiation in most of these cases. There's no sense in taking unnecessary radiation because that in itself is a separate risk. Finally, you can't change your genetics or your heredity. You can't change your frame, not too much. You certainly can't change your gender, at least not, not logistically, uh, and your race or your age. But you can control the other risk factors, like your diet, your exercise, the vitamins, and mineral intake. And I thank you very much for inviting me. My head is spinning because <laughs> there, was, there was so much information. And uh, please, please stay uh, at the mic uh, oh, sure, for sure. questions, because some do. of the, uh, of fellow, my fellow commissioners might have questions. Anyone? Yeah, come on now. You know you have questions. Um, I, I'd like for you to repeat, uh, um, how often should the bone density test be given? You know, the, the average woman with no risk factors should get their first bone densitometry at the age of 65. Most women, if you look hard enough, will have at least two risk factors, um, in addition to being a woman. And that should then happen at menopause. Not most women, but a large percentage of women at menopause. So the average age of menopause around 51. So that'll give you a baseline. And then thereafter, maybe every three to five years, depending on what actually has occurred, if there is the continuing risk factor, and particularly if there is a start of the process of osteoporosis called osteopenia, then you would want to follow that much more closely and probably think very strongly about treatment. Um, you're saying, and if you're in that age group and you have been diagnosed osteopenia, then you're advising that perhaps you would do, uh, you would do that low, uh, on the low range. The yeah, low range. if you're on the low range of osteopenia, you, you would want to follow it more often. You wouldn't then wait until 65. You would probably follow it every three years, particularly if you're treating it. If you decide not to treat it, you may want to do it in a, in a couple years, for example. But doing it one year at a time, there's often not enough change in the bone uh, depending on what's going on, if you're actually taking your calcium, doing your exercise, there may not be enough change to really show a significant difference from the previous year. So at least two to three years. But typically with osteopenia, at a minimum, you, you need to make sure you're doing your calcium and your exercise, and you need to uh, really think about the idea of treating with one of the with either estrogen replacement or possibly um, uh, one of the other medications if you're getting closer to osteoporosis. 
You're welcome. There, there was a lot of information, lot of information. And, and it's very difficult to absorb yeah. all of this. <laughs> sure. And I'm sure our That's audience... That's why we have it on tape. They can watch well, it again. I'm no, sure no. our audience is somewhat confused <laughs> yeah. about it. And I'm sure that they'll go back and look at the video archives and review everything that you mentioned. I hope that they do. But anyway, if they, if they don't have the time to do that... Um, is there a place where they can go, either on a website or some other source where they could sure information? Sure. Um, see if I can, you know, obviously if you, if you do a web search for osteoporosis, uh, try to avoid the advertisement portions, obviously. Yeah. Sure. Um, you'll, you'll tend to go to the, uh, like, um, not National Organization of Women, but um, oh God, one of the national... Uh, uh, actually, National, National Osteoporosis Foundation, NOF, um, they have some wonderful data. Um, they'll show you primary studies. They'll, they'll show you ways that you can exercise. Um, so National um, Osteoporosis Foundation is probably the most sensible approach because you're going to get legitimate scientifically based uh, information. It's not going to be biased uh, driving you to one physician or one you know, mode of exercise or what have you. That's probably the best option. That's always a problem, right? When we go into websites, we're not quite Absolutely. sure yeah. where Absolutely. to go into, and it's yeah. the National Osteoporosis, Osteoporosis Foundation. Foundation. Yeah, and, they, and you, you can always you can always um, tell when someone's done their homework on the the web. They'll come in with a stack about you know an inch thick of papers they've printed out, about ninety percent of which you know you you, you want to throw away. The problem is oh. it takes so long to go through that stack, you know, and then their visit time is over. <laughs> right. They can. Uh, I can also say that uh, probably on the. Um, National Association of Commissions on Women uh, will have information if they go to that website because I know this is their focus. Fantastic. Their health focus yeah. is osteoporosis, bone smart. And I was uh, I mentioned at the commission last month that they're thinking of um, they're going to initiate a program for young girls. Good idea. Doctor, Very and they're good calling idea. it Best Bones Forever, BBFs. Best Cute. bones forever. So we'll probably, or hopefully, uh, we're going to put that into some of our programs as well so we can start the, the young girls um, uh, when they should be, be begun, knowing about it. BBFs for BFS. BBFs. Best, best, best bone bones forever, forever for best forever. friends forever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember yeah. that with my daughter. I have a 14-year-old. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So they can go to that website as well, and there's a wealth of information there. Perfect. You can always call me. Uh, I'll definitely take care of you, and we'll hold your hand through the process. Yes, and uh, let's see. Thank you, Doctor. Um, and Dr. John Kirk is at Glendale Venice Medical Center, yep. and that's where you can reach him. Thank you so Thank much you for so having me. I appreciate Thank it very much. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Ms. Cordova? QB is Junior Achievement of Southern California, Inc., Economic Empowerment. Okay, we switch gears a little here. Chair Devine, Ms. Chair Devine, members of the commission, um, Kimberly Blum, who's the director of Junior Achievement Finance Park, and Liz Vickers, the program manager, were ready to present to us back in March, um, but unfortunately we did not have our March meeting, and we were eager to have Kim and Liz come back and present to us about economic empowerment. We didn't want anyone to miss out on the information just because we had to cancel our meeting. So thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, my head is still reeling from the information as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm currently trying to calculate my probability of developing osteoporosis, so I'm going to switch gears as well and go from physical health in women to financial health in women. So I'm here to talk about economic empowerment for women, um, specifically financial literacy and all the ways that we can help to empower um, from young girls all the way into adulthood. So my name is Kimberly Blum. I'm the director of a financial literacy program called Finance Park with Junior Achievement of Southern California. I'm also an educator. I've been an educator for about 16 years and I have taught a variety of subjects, ages, um, just about everything. Um, and specifically in terms of empowerment for women around this topic for about the past 15 or so years, but specifically in this past three years with Junior Achievement of Southern California. So I'm going to kind of talk to you a little bit about economic empowerment and help you to see not only, as you can see, um, why it matters, but what can we do about it, and specifically our target audience of women. What can women do in order to feel empowered economically, steps that they can take, and, and just a little bit of information maybe 
Um, so it might be a little, uh, a, a lot actually of information as well. I tried to kind of break that down, and, um, and I do have some um, sites where people can go to follow up afterwards. But um, one of the most important things that I like to start off with when we talk about why economic empowerment even matters for, for women, there is a direct connection between women's economic empowerment and the resulting overall quality of life, period. Um, absolutely. And I think that uh, it's certainly lo logical, it makes common sense. Um, so we want to make sure that all of the women that we personally know, as well as women in our society, are certainly empowered with uh, all of the tools that they need to be financially literate. Being economically dependent upon somebody else in many ways can be equated with the obstacles and, is and issues um, that are often associated with being poor, um, at, statistically speaking, when the federal government determines what the line of poverty is. Um, because if a source of income for a woman goes away, whatever that source of income may be, uh, and maybe it's multiple sources of income, for example, maybe it's just um, their spouse and that source of income for whatever reason goes away, or maybe it is a single parent in a home or a household where several different members of the household are contributing sources of income. If any of that income that a woman is dependent upon goes away, then obviously that woman is left in a very precarious financial situation. So there are ways that you can equate economic dependence with issues of poverty in that sense, that it puts a woman in jeopardy, financially speaking, and really is on par in a lot of ways with all of those kind of issues. Um, so obviously we want to empower women so that that does not happen to them in their lives. The Center for American Progress reports that women in America are more likely to be poor than men. In fact, over half of the 37 million Americans living in poverty today are women. And obviously, that is not a fact that we would like to sustain or maintain. So we definitely want to um, change that. Uh, interestingly enough, there is a distinction between what the actual poverty level, as set forth by the federal government, is and something else which is, um, is less statistically proven, but is nevertheless amongst us. And that is something called being working poor. Okay, And obviously there is a, a big difference between these two. But in the United States, most of the working poor are women as opposed to men. Uh, and so, and um, I always give credit to the sources where I find my, my information, and they're here on, this, uh, on these slides as well. Um, and these are alarming pieces of information for us, and this is, again, why we're, we're still in this process of understanding why economic empowerment for women is so important. So um, it's just a little bit of the background to help us to understand that we know now why it's very important to be economically independent as a woman. But of course, achieving that status is not as easy. So we want to get into the how. How can women empower themselves um, economically to be independent and to be financially literate? So I'm going to make sure that my, here we go. So empowerment, and when we're talking about economic empowerment, obviously when we get to the root of that word empowerment, knowledge is power. Having knowledge, having access to information is true empowerment. That's where everything really needs to start for, for women, and that's where we as a society need to really start to focus our, our efforts. To become truly empowered, whatever your age, whatever your gender, you need information, you need to be informed. So we want to make sure that we work with our women uh, to help them to be informed in every way possible. And everything begins with awareness, right down to the very notion of a woman being aware that she is in a precarious situation, that she can be at risk for problems down the line, um, thinking maybe perhaps she's not at all in a difficult situation, but not understanding um, the ramifications or consequences that might be eight steps down the line. Now, there are some women who, of course, this is very clear to them, they're very, very aware 
of the difficult situation that they're in. Um, so from that kind of awareness also to the awareness of, well, what do I do about it? And what skills and tools do I actually need in order to make sure that I can be financially literate and independent, economically speaking? So we want to go from awareness into um, some, some steps. Now, um, the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles is certainly one of Junior Achievement's partners, um, also a very strong proponent for women's issues across the board and specifically with regard to economic empowerment. So um, I've taken a little bit of information from them and I want to make a comment here. So girls and women in, in the Los Angeles area need education and training in economic self-sufficient self-sufficiency and financial literacy. This is especially true for those who are low income and or of color. I'm going to come back to this point, okay? Uh, and again, this is from the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles. Many of their mothers, grandmothers, or guardians were never instructed in the principles of basic economic literacy either, passing their attitudes and beliefs about money on to their daughters and granddaughters, all but ensuring that the cycle of fiscal ignorance would be continued through the next generation. Now this is logical, it's common sense. Uh, by the way, I want to take as an aside two points here. And I don't take issue with this at all. I, I agree with this every step of the way. But I'd like to say, first of all, this isn't just women. This is men and boys, too. But of course, we're here to talk about economic empowerment for women. Um, and also, it is not only women and girls of low income or of color. Certainly this statement I agree with entirely. Um, but what's often surprising for people in society to find out is that not only low income people, families and women, uh, and not only families of color struggle with economic dependence and financial illiteracy. So this is a statement I absolutely concur with, but I wanted to just make sure that I make that clarification that uh, my experience in working with people across the board from the lowest socioeconomic status to the highest so socioeconomic status, um, people would often be amazed and surprised at, at how often households are financially illiterate, even when they are affluent households. So that's a comment that I really wanted to make this very, very important. So obviously, so I've, I've got a flow chart here that kind of works backwards and forwards, but the most uh, critical <coughs> pieces of information here lie in the middle. Education and information and skills and training. And they feed back and forth. So education and information will help lead women to economic empowerment. Also having skills and training in any variety of fields, any kind of skills, any kind of training also helps to lead them to economic empowerment. And as you see on the right, obviously all of these things lead toward employment opportunities. And for skills and training, for example, in all of this education information, very often we need financial resources. Now, of course, here's the vicious cycle that we come to. Obviously, we need for women to be financially literate and economically independent. And often they're in a vicious cycle because you need often financial resources in order to get the skills and the training, in order to get the education. So I have coming uh, as well some organizations that do work in our society here in our city of Los Angeles and even close here in Glendale, that can help women to access this kind of information, even if they do not already have the financial uh, resources to do so. So true empowerment and power um, really comes from having opportunities and choices. This is where true independence for anybody, but specifically for women, comes from. And when you have opportunities and when you have absolute, total control over choices in your life, then you are truly independent, and, and not only in every sense of the word, but certainly economically speaking as well. And this is really our goal for um, all of the women that we work with. And one of the things that JA of Southern California works to do through um, my particular program, JA Finance Park, is to empower women to take financial control over their lives. And there are some ways that we uh, work to do that. Um, and I want to point out another partnership that we have that helps you to see the way that we work. We'll really work with any demographic any group, but we, we do specifically have programs even here through the city of Glendale. We work, um, as Christine knows very well, through Camp Rosie with the younger girls. We want to start to educate girls at a young age about this information. We also work 
generationally, and we will bring in um, girls and their families, their mothers, um, grandmothers, so we will do things like that. Currently we are piloting a program with Head Start of San Bernardino um, and I'm developing a curriculum with the Head Start um, Foundation there in San Bernardino. It's a financial literacy program for the heads of households of Head Start. So you can already start to see where I'm going with this, which is that when we start to empower those heads of the households for those young children who are in a Head Start program, now we're starting to educate the entire cycle. We're starting to break that cycle that I had just talked about that the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles had mentioned, which certainly exists. We're trying to help empower, first of all, those women who are the heads of their household and help them to understand how to start to have those conversations in the home with their very young children so that we can begin to break that cycle. So then this is one of the pilot programs that we're working on. We're definitely hoping to expand that. Um, Part of the things that we uh, really work with pe all people, but specifically women on, is to help them to understand how to create a budget for their expenses. And it's as simple as, you know, conceptually I say simple, but it's really challenging, of course. But the, the concept is just get on top of your financial situation by looking at your income versus your expenses. Okay? It's very, very basic concept, but very difficult to do. Um, but we, we help them to do that in a very planned way. And also some Something that's really critical is to help um, yourself out by writing down financial goals. So we really help women to understand that in order to meet your goals, writing them down always helps. And one of the ways that uh, anybody who's interested uh, in learning more about this and identifying some of your own financial goals, you could visit smartaboutmoney.org. Um, it's a website that you can navigate and there are all kinds of resources there that could help you to identify your own goals um, and also help you to identify what is your income and what are all of your expenses. So there are worksheets there that you could go through that online uh, that you could take a look at. Um, so personal money management, just to kind of go through a couple of the quick things that we definitely highlight for our women is we definitely, and, and coming back to this key term of awareness, we want women to be aware of what all of their income is. We want them to have knowledge and understanding of all of their household expenses, even those tiny little hidden ones, and especially those unexpected expenses, which often come up. And as we know, so many of our women are mothers, and we know how children are. We love them, we love them, and we know that they break a bone, and hopefully not through osteoporosis at a very young age, but we know that things come up in unexpected expenses, and if women aren't prepared for this, these are things that often are crippling for our women when, when um, they are faced with such challenges. Um, and then we provide budgeting skills and practice to help, to help actually identify what are the tools and the skills that women need to actually create a budget and live within their means. That's the most critical thing, is to not live beyond our means, and of course, obviously Obviously, it's common sense, but it's a very difficult thing to do, and so many people that we all know live outside of our means, as we help to pe uh, really teach awareness of key terms, concepts, and skills, okay? We teach about budgeting. Um, income versus expenses. Primary expenses and secondary expenses. Again, things that seem so basic to some of us are not at all basic. We need to help everybody in every household to understand the difference between a want and a need. And especially when women are faced with the very difficult challenges of raising children who want so much and we are in a society that is saturated with wants, how do we make sure that we understand what it is that we need first and foremost and how to talk to our children children about why we're having to make these tough choices, why this one thing that you want right now, we can't quite afford that yet, and why that's okay. We want to help, I mean, there's really, it's, it's everything, it's the big picture of what we're really trying to help um, people to understand, and that there are fixed expenses and that there are variable expenses. So some concepts that we teach seem quite basic, and then some are much, much more complex. Um, we help to break down budget categories and help families and women to identify what all their budget categories are short-term goals, long-term financial goals. And most critically, I think, we help women and even young girls at an early age understand 
how to establish spending guidelines for themselves, for their budget. We help them to identify the categories that they think they're going to need to spend money on and then how to limit how much money they can actually afford to spend in that category. And by setting those spending guidelines and parameters, that is one of the most key fundamental aspects and creates a roadmap, a financial roadmap to help women to understand I can't overspend in this category and or if some something else came in this particular month that was an unexpected expense, I've now got this roadmap and I understand that I've got to go into one of my other categories and I'm going to have to make some sacrifices. So it helps them to really see that and helps them to create that balance so that they understand uh, how, how to keep themselves on track. In addition, we go, go into things like credit score and credit history. As we know, establishing a good credit and also having access to credit is really key uh, for women. Um, and so we help them to understand the importance of that. And really, really key, especially as this goes back to, for example, that pilot program that we're doing with Head Start, we really encourage um, women and, and all family members to have discussions at home, in the home, with their family members about these issues. We want to break this cycle. And again, I also come back to that notion that it is not only low-income families and families of color. Not at all. I have conversations with the CEOs and the highest people and executives at corporations who run their own business. And they say to me, their own family do not have these conversations around the dinner table either. So it's really something that impacts all, um, you know, SES levels um, across the board. So. Um, a couple of things that people can do if they want to figure out, okay, how can I take some steps to become financially literate and economically independent? You could consider participating in JA Finance Park on your own with a group of friends. You might belong to an organization. You could certainly contact me or my program. We can organize a group to lead you through a simulation, a budget simulation practice um, that would help to teach you the, school, the skills and the tools that you would need to go from point A to point B and walk away with those tools in your back pocket and say, okay, now I'm going to apply this to my own house situation. So that's one um, option. One of the, and I'll come back to a couple of the others. One of the things that I like to point out is a graph most recently, um, this is a fairly current uh, chart, about the trend over the past three years in unemployment rates uh, nationally versus in the state of California. And of course, we know that we're really faced with high unemployment rates here. We also know that women and people of color are hardest hit by our unemployment rates. And so um, yet another reason why it is so critical for women to understand why and how they need to become economically independent is when they take a look at this and they realize how um, much in jeopardy their job security may be, we want to help them as we again come back to this notion of making sure that they are trained, have a skill are educated, are informed, have opportunities. And so some places that they can visit in order to help them to do this are following. Now, um, I'm going to come back to the Grameen Foundation in, in just a minute, but you've already, um, I've already made note about smartaboutmoney.org. There's also a, a website called realitycheck.com, which I really like, and a lot of our students and young people really like that as well. It helps people to navigate and get a real sense of how expensive is it really to live. Um, and, and it is exactly as it says. It's a bit of a reality check which is what our finance park simulation is for a lot of people, too. It's a major reality check, and they realize how difficult it is to live as an adult and, and how expensive it is. Um, uh, certainly for continuing your education, specifically I've started with things that are most local to the audience here. Um, Glendale Adult School, for example, provides skills and training um, to be able to continue education. The website is there. Evans Community Adult School, again, uh, fairly local, and you can find it there at evansla.org. Um, Burbank Adult School, a little bit farther out, but even still, any of the adult schools um, that, that might be near anybody who's watching. Also, you can check out community colleges. So there's, of course, obviously Glendale Community College, LA Valley College, LA City College. Um, there are community centers, vocational and tech schools. Basically any place, any opportunity that that anyone can take advantage of to go and to get themselves trained, have a skill, even if it's vocational, technical, something that's going to help go back to that overall uh, map and chart that I pointed out. Um, again, you can search uh, for community adult education information near you. Um, you can get online and, and do a search there. Um, and two other major places that I'd like to encourage people to check out, the Workforce 
Investment Board the city of Lo through the City of Los Angeles. Um, it's often referred to as WIB. Um, very often provides uh, job training and has centers all throughout Los Angeles where women can certainly take advantage of job training uh, programs that are offered there. Um, I've got a few others here that are small and hard to read, but I'm assuming that there will be access to that information for, for people who'd like to follow up on that. Um, JobsLA.org, for example, is a really interesting website to help you track the trends and figure out where, um, even financially, what jobs pay and where you might want to start to lean if you're thinking about trying to get some technical training, where you might want to start to point yourself in, in what direction. Um, and I have already mentioned the YWCA CA of Greater Los Angeles. Um, they do empowerment programs and projects, and they have programs specifically um, for women and girls, um, so you can certainly check them out as well. And uh, to wrap things up, one of the really important things that I want to mention along this trajectory to economic independence, one thing that's often overlooked is the fact that support and mentorship is really, really critical for our women. Um, we know this with so many aspects of, of society where women are disadvantaged, but it's specifically the case with economic independence. Uh, finances are things that scare a lot of people, not just women. Uh, and anybody who's trying to become empowered about anything needs a support system and definitely needs um, mentorship. Um, a quote that I'd like to uh, start to wrap up with is again from uh, David Shipler and it's from his book Working Poor, The Working Poor. So we've talked already about this first quote. A set of skills, a good starting wage, and a job with a likelihood of promotion are definitely prerequisites for economic independence, but so are clarity of purpose, courageous self-esteem, a lack of substantial debt, freedom from illness or addiction, a functional family, and a network of upstanding friends. Um, support is key. Addressing self-esteem is also really key. Um, and a final quote that I'll leave you with, one woman can do anything, but many women together can do everything. Uh, there's much, much more that I could um, overwhelm you with. Um, but again, between osteoporosis and economic um, empowerment, I'm sure that there's far too much information as it is. And so I'll kind of wrap things up there. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very Kimberly. welcome. Thank any you for your time. I'll answer comments? any questions. From yes, very briefly. Um, I tell my daughter and I tell my daughter's friends um, in fact, very recently, because they're going through APs and SATs, that get an education, get training, get a skill. Right. Don't rely on one source. Be independent economically. And that comes up in domestic violence matters. Yeah. And you know that, uh, Do. Commissioner Both Hunt. Absolutely. I've had clients come in and tell me, well, you know, I can't report this because who's going to pay my bills? Who's going, to, who's going to support me? Who's going to support my kids? And I've had people come and recant their initial testimony because, again, they're in the same position. Why? Because they're not economically independent. Exactly. But that's why it's very important. And I, I thank you for being here, and um, I'm gonna, I send a message every day to my children, go out there, get an education, get a skill, get training, and don't rely on someone else. Exactly, and have many choices, because what I heard from you just saying is don't rely on that one source. And again, it comes down to lots of choices, lots of opportunities, and to not be dependent upon that one source that you feel like if that goes away, what do you have? And you're, you're exactly right. It, it really feeds into so many of the things that go on in society that really adversely affect women. Uh, right. So this is a key and a core piece of the, the puzzle, I think, and the component. And, and um, any other comments? Um, Kimberly, uh, I just want to make uh, something clear to our 
to myself, to our commissioners, and also to the audience. Uh, these concepts that you talked about, creating the budget, um, spending guidelines, credit checks, et cetera, those are concepts that are taught at our Camp Rosie, correct, in our financial literacy absolutely. classes. Absolutely. This is what the to girls, young girls, absolutely. Yes, this is what the young girls for three weeks learn all about, and the culmination of that is a trip to Financial Park, yes. which I think is fantastic. But I want all of our viewers to know that and that the, the Camp Rosie is a perfect opportunity to start your teenagers yes. and tweens uh, into this learning situation. This education and awareness can start right here and right now. Um, what next month in July? Exactly. So yeah, um, yeah. and it's so. fun too. They uh, actually yes. know they they. It's learning is fun. <laughs> learning about money is fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you very much. You're for, very for welcome. Coming tonight, we appreciate the information. Very thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And hopefully, when we do our uh, seminars with uh, Senator Liu, uh, we'll we'll have you participate with us as well. I, love I know we had talked about uh, a budget 101 for low-income women, and uh, the, the graduation kind of gift was going to be a trip to Financial Park. So that's kind of in the works, so we'll be hopefully talking with you about that. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, Ms. Cordova, next item, please. Three is oral comment. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Time is limited to an amount to be set by the chair. The commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. Thank you. I have no card, so we'll move on to the next item, please. Four is consent items. Four A is approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting held on April 11, 2011. Are there any additions or? I move approval. I second that. And do we have consensus? Yes. Yeah. Next item, please. Five is business agenda. 5A is action items. 5A1 is consideration and discussion to adopt a resolution regarding the guidelines for the appointment of the stu student ex officio members. 5A1 is a resolution regarding the qualifications, term, procedure, standards, and rules for the appointment of the two student ex officio members. Ms. Baboumian, a brief report, please. Yes. Uh, Chair Devine, members of the Commission, um, back in April of 2004, pursuant to Glendale Municipal Code Section 2.38.030, the Commission adopted Resolution Number 4. Zero 01, and this established the qualifications, terms, procedures, standards, and rules for the appointment of the two student ex officio members. And per the Commission Resolution 41, the time frame for the upcoming student ex officio search has been to commence mid April to May. This time frame has become adjusted over time due to situational circumstances. And back at the November 2010 regular meeting of the Commission, Chair Devine and Vice Chair Toshin were appointed to serve on the Student Selection Committee for the 2011 Student Ex Officio Search. Applications had been made available starting December 1st, and the deadline to submit applications was January 15th. Although routine promotional methods were utilized, the Commission did not receive any applications, and um, staff believes that this may be due to the fact that it was during finals and during the holiday time, because part of getting the application in does involve getting letters of recommendations from two different sources. So um, basically, the Student Selection Committee, as a result, did not end up meeting, and two student ex officios were not chosen. Um, our remaining student ex officio has continued to serve the commission, and our other student ex officio, um, so Sophia Peck, had resigned from the commission in August of 2010 to go to school. Now, going back and reviewing Resolution 4.1, um, staff seemed that there was a few procedures that had not been followed at all since maybe the first one or two years that the commission um, came into effect and the resolution was implemented. Um, staff is requesting that the, resolu the resolution be amended as the procedures outlined. No, we haven't really been using them. And the biggest change I would say to um, the resolution is that the interview process is not held during a regular commission meeting and is instead conducted by the Student Selection Committee. And this has been the practice for the past few years, but in the original resolution it states that 
the finalists are to come to a commission meeting and they are to be interviewed live and then they are chosen by the entire commission. But in the past few years, it's been the student selection committee that has, um, outside of a public meeting, interviewed them and selected them and presented the appointments back to the commission. Um, the other most significant change would be to start the one-year term of the student ex officio members in September. And the benefit of this is that it will mirror their academic calendar. In, in the adjustments that we've had over time, we had our student ex officio starting in January and ending in December, which put them over two academic calendar years. And as was the case with um, student ex officio PEC, you know, they might get relocated or their, you know, their workload might change over the second course of the year. Um, the original resolution had them starting <coughs> at the June meeting, um, just that selecting them in June and then giving them enough time to prepare and enjoy their summer break and come start with the commission in September seems to be the most appropriate. And should the resolution regarding the guidelines for selecting the student ex officio members be approved, staff also recommends that the commission maintain the committee appointed at the November 2010 meeting as this committee has yet to carry out its duties. So attached you have the proposed resolution and if you have any questions I'd be more than happy to answer them. Questions? Um, I have a question. The, the selection committee, the student selection committee, is that still the chair and vice chair? So you would appoint them and? Interview them and appoint them. Choose. I think that's best because having them here, you know, I don't think that's the best idea. I agree. Um, any others? I had a um, I had a question about this. There was nothing in here about term limits. Um, if uh, if a commission an ex officio wants to um, stay for a second year, or if the commission deems the fact that that ex officio happens to be of such a caliber that we would love for her to stay, uh, no names being mentioned, um, it, there's nothing in this resolution. Do we have to put something in there, Ms. Farpetian? Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, you do not. The, because it's silent, you do have the opportunity to reappoint someone at the end of their term. Okay, and the other question is, would they have, he or she have to go through the whole process? I, I think it might be a, a better option for them to do that just in case, I don't know, there, you know, someone could reapply that didn't necessarily want to repeat. Yes, because um, the term would be limited by the terms that are set in the resolution. So at the end of the, the one year that they um, are invited to serve, at the end of that term, if the student ex officio chose to serve for another term or the commission wanted to invite the person back, then you would ask that they reapply. Okay. All right. And my uh, and the next question I have concerns something that you said and that is in this report that I read and I didn't think about it when I read it, but you said that we had no applicate no applicants this time around due to different circumstances. Uh, is there anything that we should put in the resolution that says something like if we get no applications then we forego ex officios or um, do we keep looking and is there something in there Ms. Oh, Baboumian did um, I miss? Chair Devine, members of the commission, we we did make a modification to section 2 term, section okay. 2.01, said that the terms can continue until a successor is and, uh, appointed. Right. So they can carry through. Right. Um, and I believe just changing the timing and, you know, making sure that. But let's say that if we have one, if like let's say ex officio Danellian, uh, she's serving over and above the call of, of duty. Now let's say that she decides that she's not going to stay for the second term um, and there's, there are no applicants, do we just uh, uh, stop looking or what is it, and does anything have to be put in? I don't think you need to put it in here, but um, it's incumbent on the commission to fulfill the um, requirements of the code that ask that you um, go through the efforts in trying to find um, student student commissioners. Okay. And um, as a result of that, you can the in the resolution the way it's. Um, worded gives you some flexibility in how you go about advertising 
Um, so after you've mm -hmm. put forth your your efforts and you were finding that you're not getting um, enough applicants or the or the pool is too small, then it is um, up to you as to how you'd like to expand. If you have a budget set aside, for example, to run ads, if you want to um, go to schools and actually start speaking to clubs and organizations. So all of those things are available to you. Um, they don't have to be enumerated in the um, resolution. Okay. And then whenever the um, ex officio is selected, let's say they are selected in says set start in September, let's say that they're selected in November. Does their term still go from September to September, or do we move it from November to November? It stays from September to September, correct? Sure. The, the, um, the way that the resolution is worded in Section 2.01, it says the terms of the student ex officio member shall commence at the September meeting of the Commission on the status of women and continue for one year or until a successor is appointed. So um, if for whatever reason you um, delay it, then at that point you can, um, um, during the appointment process, specify as to when you want that term to end. Okay. Because you may continue to have that pro the problem that you're having now, which is having the, um, the, the timing not be coterminous with their academic year. So if for whatever reason you've, you've got to delay at the time of the appointment, you can at that point um, uh, affirmatively determine what that term is going to be. Okay, Chair Devine, uh, yes. members of the commission, essentially that's what happened. You know, at some point we didn't have a couple of meetings when we were going through the entire board and commission reorganization, and at that time it did get pushed from the fall to the winter, and that's essentially when that happened. And we do also have a section, um, authorization to modify procedure, mm -hmm. and that was in the original one too. We just wanted to, okay. staff wanted to make sure to bring something that is more reflective of what the Commission's practice is at this time. But if we are to mod you know, modify our time frame or our procedures, it doesn't, you know, temporarily, it won't affect the validity of the appointments. Okay. Do I have a motion to uh, yes. adopt this resolution? M Madam Chair, just, oh, a, just a quick um, yes. uh, language change. Instead of saying updating the qualifications, I think revising may be a better word. So it's the resolution of the Commission on the Status of Women the City of Glendale revising the qualifications, term, procedures, standards, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. So do I have a, uh, a motion to accept this resolution or adopt the resolution of the Commission on the Status of Women updating or, I'm sorry, <laughs> re revising the qualifications, term, procedures, standards, and rules for the appointment of the two student ex officio members? I'll make that motion. I second. second. Uh, Ms. Boumian, can we have roll call, please, for this one? Ms. Cordova? Chair Devine? Yes. Commissioner Garcevanian? Aye. Commissioner Hunt? Yes. Vice Chair Tastian? Yes. Commissioner Walker? Thank you. Next item, please. <coughs> 5B is reports, information only. 5B1 is Commission on the Status of Women's. 2011 master calendar of events. Okay, the calendar. Are there any additions or corrections? I see none. So those are that is um, note and filed. Noted and filed. Next, 5B2 is update on sexual assault awareness month. SAM activities. Ms. Baboumian. Um, Chair Devine, members of the Commission, now that the month of April and Sexual Assault Awareness Month is over, staff would like to present the final report for SAM. So as we know, we have the proclamation for Sexual Assault Awareness Month and Denim Day in Glendale, and that is where the Mayor and City Council presented the proclamation um, on Tuesday, March 29th at the Glendale City Council meeting. We had our self-defense classes, and these are the two self-defense classes that the Commission sponsored for women and girls in the community that was at no cost to them. One class was held Thursday, April 7th in the community room of the Glendale Police Department and as a result of new direction from our student ex officio Marie Denellian, the other class was held on Thursday, April 21st at Glendale Community College and the feedback that we were served we received about having one class at the college was wonderful. Um, I think it was, it's a good direction to go in, so thank you for that. 
Um, both classes had approximately 60 women and girls in attendance each, and that brought the total number of women and girls served this year to 120. We had a very diverse range of ages and backgrounds. We had um, senior citizens who watched, but you know because they couldn't physically participate, they watched. We also had an entire soccer team of 12-year-old girls attend, so it was wonderful. <laughs> The classes were provided by the longtime commission partner, Shield Self-Defense, led by Nelson Neo. And as I mentioned, staff did receive a lot of great feedback from those who attended the event. Um, Edith Fuentes, who is um, a staff member here, and she's also the immediate past president of Seroptimus of the Verdugos, had sent us a note to thank us, for, thank the commission, and express how much she enjoyed and learned from the class, and that she thinks that all women and girls should experience these self-defense classes at some point. And then we had our Denim Day in Los Angeles and Glendale. And as we know, for the past five years, the commission has supported peace over violence with the Denim Day in LA awareness and fundraising drive. And we have organized the Denim Day in Glendale fundraiser through the city of Glendale employees, where employees pay $5 so they can wear denim and they get their pins. This year, we were able to raise um, over $1,200. <laughs> For Denim Day, and this has brought our total donated amount to date to $5,800 that we have given to Peace Over Violence through Denim Day. And the culminating event for um, Sam was a Take Back the Night rally and clothesline project. And this was the event that we did with the YWCA of Glendale to take a stand against <laughs> sexual violence, specifically against women. It was held on Thursday, April 28th from 6 to 8 p.m. And it started on the front steps of the Glendale Police Department, and it included speakers from the Glendale City Council, Glendale Unified School District Board, Glendale City Clerk, the Glendale Police Department, the Glendale Commission on the Status of Women, and the YWCA of Glendale. Um, and staff would like to thank all the representatives to came and speak, including Council Member Quintero and Captain Michael Rock of the Glendale Police Department. Participants then marched east on Broadway, north on Glendale Avenue, went to the YWCA for the clothesline reception, which was on display, as well as artwork that's been done by um, people who utilize for services at YWCA. And um, over at the Y, we had Peggy Reyna, Project Director of Peace Over Violence, who provided a presentation on intergenerational domestic violence and talked about the different cycles of violence she had seen throughout the generations within her own family. And we also had Jasmine Seha, the Youth Programs Coordinator of Break the Cycle, and she provided a presentation on teen dating violence. And that concludes my update for Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the work that you did to put that month together. Amazing. Very good job. Uh, commissioners, any comments on the events, activities? Only, Hunt? only that it was just wonderful. I, I participated in Take Back the Night for a number of years, and this one was terrific, as usual. It's always um, gratifying to march up Glendale Avenue with our signs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and have people driving by honking their horns and waving because they get it. I mean, people get it. When, you, when it's right in your face like that, you get it. It doesn't mean that they get it when they get home, but it means they, they understand what we're, what we're talking about. So, um, And the presentation from the woman from Peace Over Violence about the intergenerational violence was sobering, to say the very least. Um, Shocking was a little bit more the way I felt, but anyway, it was it was interesting, um, and I just enjoyed very much the opportunity to participate again. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Um, I just want to uh, again um, thank uh, Ms. Baboumian. Uh, the self defense classes were um, so much fun to uh, participate in and also to watch all of the, the young girls uh, learning self-defense. And then, of course, there would be men there watching. And we, we were very, um, I was impressed because one of our police officers mm -hmm. were, was at the conference room watching to make sure that the self-defense that he's teaching our officers is uh, what S.H.I.E.L.D. is teaching. And then, of course, Nelson Neo has to ask all the men to leave in the second half because he doesn't want them to see um, how women protect themselves down on the ground, which I think is, uh, is, is pretty interesting and, and pretty, uh, pretty great. Um, uh, I 
thought the speaker, um, Peggy, Peggy Reyna, was absolutely astonishing. And I would like to see her, because it was focused on domestic violence, I would like to see her come here in October to speak about domestic violence, if we can get her to uh, shorten her presentation. Uh, because, uh, I mean, she, her whole family was, I mean, talk about the cycle of violence. Um, she lived it and survived it, thank God. But um, I would like for more women to see her, and uh, I'm going to be uh, pushing for that around the city, especially to Seroptimist and possibly at our commission meeting as well. Uh, one kind of negative comment. Um, next year, I would like to see the focus of the speakers, all the speakers, be on sexual assault. Domestic violence is in October, and uh, so I, and I know that they're they're core, you know. They're together. They're, it, it's all practically the same. But um, I, I would like to um, to see a separation there on the focus uh, next year. So maybe we can work on that, Miss Baboumian. But all in all, I thought the month was amazing, uh, starting from the uh, um, the proclamation to the self defense classes. Brilliant having them at GCC, yeah, and we'll continue to idea. do that. Uh, the co-eds were there, and they were so thankful that we were there. So it was it was wonderful. Thank you, ex officio. Danellian, fantastic, and the take back the night clothesline project was very well done. Very well done. So thank you very much. Noted and filed. Next item. Six is commissioner and staff comments. <coughs> okay, and uh, let's start with uh, ex officio Danellian. <laughs> so, um, just to thank um, Christine Bavillion and um, Chair Devine for the self-defense at GCC. I know there was a lot of work going into it, so I just really appreciate it. Um, I just um, also wanted to say I got a lot of student feedback afterwards, and I know there were a few students, and but they came to me the day afterwards and they're like, please have this every year at GCC. So Good. I'm hoping that in the coming years we could get this um, word out more so then more students could join in. And then also they were so excited. They told me that this summer they're going to take the Shields courses. So good. <laughs> it's right. doing good. I just want to thank the commission for that. And then um, I also want to thank the commission for the Jewels of Glendale luncheon. I'd like to congratulate the award winners. I think they were all wonderful, extraordinary women. Um, and I also want to commend the commission for the work they did on putting the event together. It was really nice. So, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Garsbanian? Uh, I'd just like to thank our um, presenters today, Dr. Kirk and Mrs. Blum. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope more <coughs> viewers did too. Mr. Commissioner Toshkin. Yes. Thank you. Well, we had a very successful luncheon, and we had over 200 people that attended. Um, I'd like to single out the staff for their support. I'd like to single out also uh, Chair Devine and most importantly, the chair of the luncheon, Susan Hunt. Um, I think you did an excellent job. Sincerely, honestly, you did an excellent job. Everything went smoothly. Uh, and um, I wish you success uh, in all your endeavors, not just community endeavors. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Well, um, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, I also want to reiterate again, thanks to staff, oh my gosh, for the Jewels of Luncheon, Jewels of Glendale Luncheon. We really couldn't have done it so smoothly and so efficiently without them. It was really wonderful. And congratulations again to our awardees, Mona Marcos, Lynn Raggio, Tanis Rines, Blanca Zavala, Lana Haddad, and our student gem winner from Glendale High School, Ani Gazakanian. And Suzanne Watley, who was our wonderful mistress of ceremonies, um, she did a great job. I enjoyed her little her her little um, piece about her mother, and this was one independent woman she grew up with, so it was pretty cool. I, the whole thing was just a great day, and I'm very pleased that it went so well, and that others thought that it went well too. <laughs> 
Um, and of course, my short term on this commission has been really enjoyable. I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks to everybody. It's been a great little run, little run, and I have enjoyed it very much. Um, st uh, thank you, Commissioner Hunt, and uh, we'll we'll continue with you in a, in a minute. Uh, staff has uh, comments. Um, I do have a few comments. Good More comments. than usual. Um, <laughs> I just I do want to thank the commission um, for the successful Jules luncheon. Thank you for all your direction and your work. And thank you to the community members who come and support the commission. You know, it's city staff members, community members. You know, everyone reaches into their pockets to help the commission, and that's what keeps, you know, financially the commission going and allows the commission to do the work that it does. And um, I also have a nice announcement. The Glendale Youth Alliance, also known as GYA, um, it's an organization that the commission works very closely with, particularly during Camp Rosie. They're having their Employees of Tomorrow fundraising luncheon on Wednesday, June 22nd at Anush Banquet Hall on Glen Oaks. I am pleased to announce that the Commission on the Status of Women will be honored at this luncheon. Um, they will be getting the Friend of Youth Award at the luncheon. The other honorees include Marshalls and TJ Maxx for the Community Partnership Award, Massage Envy for the Employer of the Year Award, and Bliss Unlimited, Linda Maxwell and Jose Quintanar for the Honoree Award. Now typically this luncheon takes place in late August, but for the first time in 15 years, GYA does not have any funding to operate the Summer Youth Employment Training Program, which is why they're having their fundraising luncheon early so they can hopefully raise enough money to continue through the summer. Sponsorship opportunities are available and individual tickets are $50 for those who are interested. They can contact Tina Osborne at 818-548-2714. And I would also like to thank Commissioner Hunt for um, serving on the commission. Thank you for all the direction you gave during the Jules luncheon and just in general, it has been a pleasure to have you here and to serve you. And you will be greatly missed and your stint was short, but you did not max out your term. So in the future, <laughs> please um, right. consider right. coming keep back that, to the keep, commission keep when the opportunities become available. <laughs> you never know when opportunities become available. Right. Keep your application. Uh, keep it hot. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Petian, Ms. Cordova? Okay, I'll finish with my comments. Um, I, I'm really proud of that GYA uh, award. Yeah. That's a, the second one this year for, for the commission, and I don't know any other commission that's gotten any sort of award. So um, uh, we must be doing something right, and that uh, that makes makes me happy. Uh, just a brief rundown. Uh, since last month, um, I did attend the book dedication for Bully Me Not. Uh, Cindy Cleary, the director of libraries, was there and uh, with the Rotary and uh, their president, uh, Zavin Kazazian. We donated uh, $3,000 worth of books on anti-bullying. Fritz Coleman was there. He was the guest and um, uh, spoke about um, his, his uh, experiences and uh, his involvement in that project. Uh, Commissioner Hunt and I spoke at the uh, Association of College Women and University Women and uh, we enlightened them about the commission and a few of them came to the luncheon in support of us so that was very nice but uh, one little antidote they are giving their annual scholarship uh, at the end of this month and we were invited to go to that because uh, one of the ladies uh, that was on the panel to pick mentioned that when interviewing the applicants for this scholarship, the one that is receiving it mentioned that she is a graduate of Camp Rosie. And the women didn't know what that was. And they said that now they know. Now they know. And they'll be looking for that. So that was a very proud moment for, uh, uh, for the commission as well. So we'll, uh, uh, I'll go and uh, hopefully see her get uh, her, uh, her uh, grant. The luncheon was great. Thank you, Christy, uh, Ms. Baboumian and, and Ms. Cordova for all the work. I personally want to thank the sponsors, Glendale Venice Medical Center, bless you for your um, diamond sponsor. Our emeralds were Caruso affiliated, the Americana at Brand, Glendale Management Association, Glendale Memorial Hospital, thank you for, for jumping into the fray uh, with your new foundation director and Glendale Water and Power. And of course our Ruby sponsors, Acura of Glendale, 
Uh, Jeannie Brewer is a former jewel, and uh, we thank her for her continuing support of our commission. And of course, Massage Envy, Helen McDonough, who has always supported this commission from day one. And I'm so pleased that Massage Envy is going to be getting an award from the Glendale Youth Alliance. That's fantastic. Uh, I have a show and tell, and this is from Elizabeth Sadlin and the Girls on the Run program. And this is the t-shirt for <laughs> their, their um, uh, classes right now and they're headed for the Rose Bowl in I think June and you can see our logo on the back so we're very proud of that yeah okay that's um, one of our our favorite uh, uh, projects uh, I want to announce, and, and this comes at a time when uh, Kimberly was here talking about financial literacy, and at the Domestic Violence Task Force meeting uh, last week, it was announced that CalWORKS, which is the cash, uh, cash um, aid in California, for that's the welfare program actually, they're going to be announcing this month uh, that in, on July 1st, they are going to um, shorten the length of time that a recipient will receive money. It's going from four years to 48 months. Um, so if That's any of you know someone that might be affected by this, please have them call uh, Neighborhood Legal Services to answer questions. Uh, the domestic violence victims are, um, they will get an extension, but they must self-identify. So um, that, that's the good news. Uh, substance abuse and mental health um, recipients will be uh, cut to 48 months. The number for Neighborhood Legal Services, in case someone is interested, is 291-818, of course. 291-1783. My last announcement concerns Glendale Healthy Kids, and they're having their Taste of Glendale day after tomorrow, Wednesday, from 5.30 to 8.30 in downtown Glendale on Brand. Tickets are only $30. There are 40 restaurants participating. There will be wine tasting sponsored by Massage Envy uh, at Kohan in the Americana, and you can buy your tickets that night uh, at the Alex Theater, so you don't have to like have them already or in hand. Uh, you can get them that evening at 5.30, and the wine tasting is extra. So please come and support Glendale Healthy Kids, Taste of Glendale, Wednesday night, 5.30 to 8.30. That's the good news. Now the bad news, and I'm sorry to say that we are losing uh, Commissioner Hunt. And what can we say about, about Susan? Uh, it was an honor to have her on our commission. Uh, you um, came on board, you stepped right up and took over as chair for the luncheon. Uh, and that was um, appreciated, especially by Ms. Baboumian and myself. <laughs> and uh, I thank you for that. Uh, and because you were on the, the committee that fought for this commission from the beginning, um, I know that you had at heart. Uh, you cared about it, and you had the passion for it, and, and I appreciate that. And I know that we'll be working with each other yes, somewhere will. in this community, Seroptimist, and a lot of other places, won't we, yep. Susan? So we will, we will. I thank you very much for, for stepping on. You know, when you, we took this position, we, we didn't know if it would be for months or for years and it turns out it was the Just former months. and sorry about that I, I, it I, works we, we will miss you thank we you will very miss much. you and thank you for stepping up and so for your service oh we have a plaque and it says the city of glendale recognizes susan hunt with gratitude <laughs> for your outstanding service to the Commission on the Status of Women. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's a, oh, now, I'm going honest. to throw it back to the, uh, my fellow commissioners in case some of them didn't have an opportunity to wish you well. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? I would. I, I had Mr. pleasure Garcelloni. working with you, and it's <laughs> really sad cool. to see you go. I wish you well in all your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very Anyone much. Anyone else? Com Commissioner Denellian? I would say you're a very, very, very effective asset to this commission. I think we were here, but then you made us up here. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's great. Yeah. So thank you. And I'm sure we'll work with. We certainly yeah, will. I mean, we're still if, here. We, if we have to <laughs> rope her I'm not in. going to Brazil. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I, I want to end the meeting with Susan Hunt's um, seroptimist uh, description or a phrase, if that's okay with everyone. Things. You're saying? 
Women who behave rarely make history. And with that, may I have a motion for adjournment? I move that we adjourn. All right, and we are adjourned <laughs> at 7 o'clock. Thank you.